My name is Evan Weinberg. I'm a senior dev tech compute at NVIDIA. You can take those five words in my title and rearrange them in any order, and they still sort of make sense. That's one of my favorite parts of my title. <laughs> um, so that may actually be wrong. I don't know. Um, to give a little bit of my background, I'm not only a code junkie. I got my PhD in physics doing last QCD stuff, finishing in 2015, and then I switched to algorithmic work as part of the ECP, so I'm used to bureaucracy. And then I joined NVIDIA in 2018. Uh, so I have a little bit of background all over the place. Okay, so depending on how long I ramble for, we'll see how many sections we get to. Um, but I'm going to start with key takeaways, so then your eyes can glaze over if you want them to. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the SNAP potential, because it's going to be a, a vehicle for discussion, but I'll keep it quick. You guys are smart. Uh, we'll look at a full iteration of the SNAP potential, running lamps. Uh, we'll dig into one kernel. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about this thing called arithmetic intensity and some optimization. And then I'll give some last thoughts. OK, so this is key takeaways. Um, I get it. I love workshops because I can focus on my work and uh, ignore my emails. Everyone just like close your laptops for three slides, just three. And then you can do whatever you want. I won't take it personally. OK, all right. Key takeaway one, an incorrect code can run as quickly as you want. If your code doesn't work, just these slides aren't going to help you. Make your code work first. OK, that's, that's point one. Point two, your favorite part of the code probably isn't the performance critical one. I like shiny objects. Y'all like shiny objects. We're all humans. We all get addicted to TikTok and Instagram and things like that. But when you're optimizing code, be systematic about it. And that's kind of what this talk is going to be about. OK, this is the last slide you really have to pay attention to so you can act like you, you learned something from it. And then again, you know, go back to whatever you want to do. Um, Profiler guy optimization or analysis driven optimization, depending on which article or blog post you're reading, is um, you know, sit down, benchmark your code, your workflow, whatever. Uh, identify whatever the core limiter is, what part, you know, what kernel, communications, whatever takes the most time. And time is the important thing here. Uh, do a deep dive analysis of that core limiter. So just focus on that. Ignore everything else, all the other shiny objects. Optimize it appropriately, whatever that may mean. Obviously, it depends on what you're focusing on. Uh, and then return to step one, you know, and just keep doing this until you run out of funding. Or you can do science fast enough. Up to you. Uh, so, okay, some other disclaimers, and this is where if your eyes start to glaze over, I understand. Um, I'm going to commit some cardinal sins in this presentation. Uh, there's going to be code on slides. I'm sorry, and I'm going to try to make it go as quickly as possible and keep it as focused as possible and highlight what matters. Um, I'm also going to add some command line commands. Uh, I wrote this line about five minutes before I came up here, so that's why it's a, a little unclear. Don't write these down. These slides, I think, are going to be posted, or there's going to be screen caps available. So look at them then. Like, don't, don't scribble bash lines. Uh, I'm going to use the SNAP potential as a vehicle to discuss an optimization workflow. You're probably doing something different. You may be using SNAP. So like, this is just representative. Uh, and like, I don't know, come talk to me afterwards. I'm, I'm like literally here. I'm not here virtually. I'm literally here. I will sit down with you and your laptop and we can go through all of this hands on. So like all of this is great, but that's, that's what I'm here for. Come talk to me. Okay, um, I'm going to bore you all with a quick reminder on what the SNAP potential is uh, for those who don't know. Um, yeah, a lot of you know this. So Snap is awesome. I think the descriptors are really cool, but that's the physicist in me talking and not like the panicked programmer. Um, cool. So who'd have thought atoms have atoms around them in their neighborhood? Uh, Snap is cool because it approximates the neighborhood of an atom by a, a spectral decomposition in a 4D hyperspherical basis, which is really cool. Uh, 3D is overrated. 4D is great. Uh, these are mapped onto Cayley Klein parameters, two complex numbers, A and B. The neighborhood's expanded in a basis of Wigner matrices or Wigner matrices. I don't know. depends on who I'm talking to. Uh, the j's are half integers, which scares a lot of people. So lots of things get multiplied by 2, so you get integers when you're writing code. Um, f is a cutoff. Uh, j is truncated to 4, so the largest matrix is 9 by 9. Uh, you know, again, counting is great. OK, so this is the part where I get scared. Um, these U's are an invariant, so we produce invariant triple products. I'm not going to talk about this much because I'm not going to be talking about the kernel that does this in the code. So let's just uh, skip, skip through this one. Um, linear potential. 
Okay, back to reality. Uh, so at the end of the day, you also want to compute a force because that tells you how atoms move. So we take a really gross expression. We take a derivative of it using my favorite thing, the product rule. Um, and we rearrange it. And at the end of the day, we have this kernel at the end that I'm going to talk about where you compute the derivative of these Victor matrices. Okay. Cool beans. Everyone with me so far? I mean, maybe glazed over a little bit for those equations, but like otherwise sort of here. Cool. Okay. All right. So, oh my God, a table with equations on it. Cardinal sin one right here. This is meant to say that A, I know what I'm doing, and B, that there's four key kernels going on in this. There's computing the Wigner matrices, computing some very scary group theory things, computing the derivatives of them, and assembling them all together into forces. So one of these lucky kernels is going to be the thing we're going to care about today. Um, OK, here's a key point. Time to solution matters. Like, I know we're in the, the race to the exascale, which means you stick as much FP64 as possible on a chip, and you get a number, and that's cool. Uh, but at the end of the day, time to solution for science is really what matters. If you can't get your science done, no one cares. Uh, so time the key parts of your code. Don't look at flop numbers. There's various approaches to this. C's time function, it's bad. Don't use it. C++11 stood chrono, it's a lot better. Uh, or take advantage of visual profilers, things like that. Uh, now, cardinal sin, code, don't write this down. It is impossible to find how to use std chrono. So if you want to time your code with std chrono, come look at these slides afterwards. Copy, paste, done. This is where the slides get useful. Um, remember, on a GPU, things by default are going to launch asynchronously. Stan talked about this a little bit. So uh, if you're running, in this case, CUDA code, I'm from NVIDIA. I'm obligated to talk about this, but this applies to anything else. I'm just here, you know, I'm just here. Um, so stick a device synchronize in there before your timer. Otherwise, you're going to do a really good job finding out that kernels take about four microseconds to launch, uh, which is great for that and nothing else. Um, another thing to remember is synchronizing has overheads too, but it's additive. It only matters for ratios, and it doesn't matter for actually just like timing things. So don't freak out too much. I also like visual tools. You know, Stan referred to Insight Systems. That's NVIDIA's thing. There's also Omni something something from AMD. Um, I don't know if VTune from Intel does full end-to-end -end traces, but you know, pick your favorite tool, ask someone what your favorite tool is or what their favorite tool is. I'm going to talk about Insight because I'm used to it. It's not just because I'm an NVIDIAN, but it's correlated. So uh, Insight Systems is good for visually tracing CUDA kernels, memory copies, MPI calls, all of that. One of the reasons why NVProf, my take for one of the reasons why we split NVProf into different tools is to better emphasize different parts of the profiling workflow. So I said, you know, part one is time your application. That's what Insight Systems is for. So I like to capture a trace on the command line, copy the trace locally, and investigate it in the GUI. Um, this is, again, another one of those cardinal sins I talked about. It's really hard to figure out how to just do things. All documentation in the world is bad. Um, so what you do is someone gives you a command, you copy, paste it, and mess with it, and you know, do dash dash help until you sort of know what's going on. So again, don't write this down. Don't write these down. Um, there's documentation for the record, but like, look at the slides afterwards. Come talk to me. This is just so you, so I, you know I did something. OK, cool. So I traced Snap. So this is actually from a couple of years ago before, I don't know, I, I did some thinking, Stan did some thinking, Roel did some thinking, Aiden did some thinking. Lots of people thought about this very hard. Insert more citations here. And this is what it looked like as of uh, PR uh, 1693. Uh, so there's four key kernels going on here. And if you've looked at a more recent trace, which we'll do later, some of them are gone. So there's those four kernels I've talked about. It's you know, compute UI, Wigner matrices, YI, scary uh, group theory stuff, DUI, DRJ, derivatives of Wigner matrices, DEI, DRJ. Let's accumulate some forces. Um, quiz, which kernel should we focus on? Anyone, anyone, anyone? Shout it out. Yeah, why? Exactly. Good. See, this is easy. Time it. It's great. Everything is a meter stick in this talk. All right, so let's, uh, let's dig into a kernel. 
Okay, oh my god, equations. So the elements of these U's, these Wigner matrices, are defined by recursive polynomials in these Cayley Klein parameters A and B. Uh, so you have some matrix, so this is the, the three by three one, and then you can write the elements of the larger one as a recursive polynomial of a recursively in functions of the elements in the same column on the smaller matrix. Or, you know, this scary thing. And I made this picture. Uh, okay, so this equation can't be used in the last column of your new matrix. Um, but there are symmetry relations for the Wigner matrices that you can use to deal with that, relating one half to the other half. Uh, if it seems suspicious that that's the only way you can deal with it, your su uh, suspicion is good. There are always more equations for everything. We'll talk about it later. So um, how does this look, or how does this work in the code? We start with the zero with Wigner matrix, which unsurprisingly is one. Everything starts with one. Great number. And if not, you absorb a scaling factor into something and it becomes one again. You then use this recursion relation to compute an element of the next Wigner matrix, U one half, in the zero width column of it. And then you use the symmetry relations to fill out the full thing. And then you construct elements of the next matrix, symmetrize, blah, 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 and you're done. And what this approach does, as of the version of the code I started talking about, is each step along the way, it stores things in a global memory cache, so it can be snarfed later, that's a technical term, snarfed later um, when you get to the next Wigner matrix. Oh my god, code. Okay. All right. What's going on here? This code is terrifying. All right, so we want to build up this thing. So let's use colors. This outer loop here. Which matrix am I building? This loop here, which, uh, which column am I doing? And then this actually useful math is actually computing elements in the columns. So this is, the, this is code we're going to talk about, unfortunately slash fortunately, depending on your mood. OK. And then the last bit is, remember, we're doing derivatives. So we have this, you know, this lad in here, this product rule. Um, our Wigner matrices are functions of the position. So we can take our recursion relation and take the product rule and get a recursion relation derivative type thing. And here's a picture. Everything's visual. You know, if there's group theory, you can probably drive pictures. It's even true when you're talking about code. So, you know, in a kernel, technically in compute UI, we're computing just this by this process I described for. And when you want to compute the derivative, you just draw the same picture again and do the same thing in the same for loop, and the code gets four times longer. OK, I've tortured you with background. I'm so sorry. Uh, but I promise it's all going to be useful, or I'll bring it back to useful if your eyes have glazed over. So Nsight Compute is the other half of what we you know, grabbed out of MVProf. And the purpose of Nsight Compute is you know, part of this profiler guided or analysis driven optimization. You know, look at the entire thing, use your meter stick, figure out what took the longest, and then grab that one thing and you know, drill in on that. So, oh my god, NCU is confusing. That's the command line name of it, figuring out how to snarf things. So here's a quick example. And again, don't write this down. I guess you can sketch this if you want to. You know, OK, you can. Um, this is such a pain, so I'll go through it once. You have this profile, and you see this thing, and you get scared. So then you select the row, and you pick events view, and you go down here, and then here's this terrifying Cocos function name with templates and all of that. Um, look at these slides later. So if you thought the ensys command line command was terrifying, oh my god, NCU is terrible. Um, it, I think it took me like a month to figure all of these things out, and I work for the company. <laughs> so, and I like, you know, the documentation's definitely gotten better over the course of the years, but like it's all like figure it out once, copy paste it, realize you need to do something else. Again, don't write this down. The slides will be posted later, but hopefully you can like take this, you know, like you don't even have to care about what this regular expression is, just like plug some words in. It's great. Cool. All right. 
Come to me later if you're confused, terrified, I can't blame you. Okay, so you take a profile and you look at it in the GUI like, oh my god, more data. First, you know, first obnoxious command line arguments, then lots of data. Um, which is, data is great if you know how to organize it. So let's kind of drill in on the one thing that's important, which is this little green, or these little bars right here. So, you know, oh my god, data barf. Little visual bars. Pictures are good. So what is this telling us? You know, your kernel could either be compute bound or memory bound. And whichever bar is bigger tells you which you're bound by. And then if the bar goes all the way to the right, you're doing a really good job doing it. And if it doesn't, there's probably some work you could do. Um, so just based on this, we can see it's like at a high level, memory bound. You can start scaring yourself with these tables that talk about where you're most limited. Uh, so here we're limited by global memory. And then like there's these other scary L2 things like crossbar cycles active. You can mouse over it and try to understand what it means. And again, it confuses me too. And it's my job. So, you know, okay. So just like take the first word. First word, DRAM. Cool. We're limited. This stuff, cool. Doesn't matter. That matters. There's further details, or there's more details further down where you can get into like what your memory workload analysis is. You know, and this is just like putting in some due diligence. This is here, it's like your memory's busy. Are you saturating bandwidth? Are your memory pipes full? Lots of details. Um, this is maybe what that means. Um, and we can go down a rabbit hole real fast. Like we're only, you know, we're on basement two. We could go down to basement 100. You know, we could be somewhere in the mantle before long. Uh, so let's, for the purpose of this talk, just like, does this make sense? Should this kernel be memory bandwidth bound in the first place? So let's do a, a sidebar. Let's talk about what I mean by arithmetic intensity. And um, let's grab some pencils and papers. Or, or don't. Again, you know, all these slides will be posted. So what should the limiter be of your program? We can broadly characterize limiters into two classes. So traditionally, you may hear compute bound. And to you, compute bound will just mean floating points. It could mean that. It could be integers. It could be tensor cores, MMA operations. It could be, I don't know, like bitwise math, depending on what you're doing. Not everything is floating point, uh, which is something that's slowly being learned over time. And then there's you know, memory bound, <clears throat> which more broadly means how quickly can I feed data. So traditionally, that's DRAM bandwidth, but it could be cache bandwidth. It could be ca or, um, feeding memory from a shared memory in the context of GPUs. It could also be like, how fast am I getting data over the network, depending on what part of my workload I'm looking at. So like, you know, again, not everything is FP64. Not everything is DRAM bandwidth. So to kind of motivate it and we'll justify it, a typical bandwidth bound kernel is vector addition. So your reading order end data, your computing order end data, your memory read. You know, a, a nice way to think about this one kind of is actually like how far do you have to move the electron? You have to move the electron a lot farther for, you know, to read and write data than you have to for compute. So it's probably going to take longer to read. You're probably going to be compute, or, um, bandwidth bound. A typical compute bound kernel at scale is matrix multiplication. You know, it's... This is how you know I finished my slides only a little bit ago. Uh, it's you know order n squared read write, order n to the third compute or n cubed compute. So asymptotically, this is going to be compute bound. You have way more math to do than data to move. So we'll talk about vector addition really quickly, and then we'll get back to more interesting stuff. So OK, doing stuff for each element i. You need to, these are floats, by the way. Not, again, not everything is FP64. Sometimes you can use FP32. Um, you're going to have to read two FP32 numbers, four bytes each. Store one FP32 number, another four bytes. Uh, so for a total of 12 bytes. One floating point operation, uh, F add. And we can take this kind of useful ratio that we're going to call the arithmetic intensity on the next slide which is you know, one addition per 12 bytes, and that's uh, 0.08 operations per byte of data. And we can ask ourselves, just in a vacuum from this number alone, is this compute bound or memory bound? And uh, you know, again, it's probably memory bandwidth bound, but let's be sure. And this is where architecture dependence comes in. You know, GPUs have a different, what's, um, where am I going with this thought? 
This type of uh, breakdown goes differently for a CPU or a GPU, depending on your system. So let's talk about a hypothetical machine, hypothetical CPU machine, where I've picked some numbers that aren't one to look smart and then made them equal to each other, so they divide to one. So your memory bandwidth is three gigabytes per second, and your FP32 operations are three gigaflops. The ratio of operations to memory bandwidth, you know, three divided by three, one, great, real math. And the ratio for vector addition we computed on the previous slide is less than one. So a way to think about that is data is fed to the program slower than operations can be performed on it. So this is a bandwidth bound kernel. And on the other hand, with, you know, if this ratio was greater than one, that means you have more work to do than data to give it, so you're gonna be compute bound. So this ratio is formally known as the arithmetic intensity. Uh, there's a nice visual way to talk about it, which we'll get into a little bit later called the roof line model. That will help you tell you, help tell you if your code is memory bound or compute bound, and it will vary depending on your architecture, if you're bound in memory or DRAM, cache, et cetera. Um, this is really important, if not required reading for performance analysis and things like that, which means I've only read half of it, but you know, do as I say, not as I do. So this, this is a great paper that talks about draw, uh, drawing these roof line plots, how to take advantage of roof line plots as a way to tell you how to target optimizing your code, things like that. So you know, again, this one, this one may actually be worth writing down or going back to the slides later, because this will cover things more general than I'm gonna be talking about. Okay, oh my God, code, we're back, what's up? All right, again, all this code is here to scare you. So let's just talk about the core part of this code and let's think about what the arithmetic intensity is of this. Uh, so we get to do some kindergarten counting. Cool, read this value u, it's a complex double 16 bytes. Do some multiplications and some additions. I forget why I put a star there, it's fine. So if you count it out, there's a, you know, a multiply, a fuse multiply add, and a fuse multiply add times two. So there's six more operations. And this is also, it's plus equals, so we're writing 16 bytes. And we do the same rigmarole again down here. So we're doing 12 operations for 32 bytes of input and output. So the arithmetic intensity is 0.375, so it's on any architecture these days, probably gonna be memory bound. Um, okay, here's a, you know, I, I can't turn my mic off right now. I would otherwise, but a, there's a really important thing um, to keep in mind, and that's uh, marketing data. Uh, you're gonna see, you see slides on architectures, and you're like, look at these teraflops. And this is me going back to saying, you know, time for solutions, all that matters. Uh, uh, Pretty typical marketing trick is you're gonna see on something that um, floating point is some number of teraflops. And that's assuming that every single operation is a fuse multiply add. So if your application is only doing additions, you're only gonna hit ha at best half of the marketing flop rates. And that's just because this doesn't get said in marketing print, but if you look at the right things and Insight compute it's there, so this isn't like an internal secret, you just have to dig into documentation and stuff like that. Something fun just to keep in mind, the numbers are tricky. And that's why I kind of make that distinction here that flops numbers tend to assume everything's an FMA. Well, it could be a multiply and that's taking the same number of cycles. Sidebar over, don't fire me. Insight Compute will do all sorts of useful things like give you roofline plots. And this is a default roofline plot that you're gonna get. Um, this is actually for the derivative kernel, the important one. I just went through the math for the non-derivative kernel because I wanted it to be 20 lines of code instead of 80. Um, but the math actually still relatively well works out. So what's going on here? This is covered really well in that paper I told you to read. But basically, we have arithmetic intensity on the x-axis, so the amount of flops of work you're doing per byte. And remember, you could also this is for floating point, you could draw roofline for integer operations, whatever. This on here is your number of flops per second. So what you can do is you can take your code, you can count floating point operations, uh, count the bytes read, and you can figure out where on this figure your code goes. 
And this gets a little confusing. This is FB32. It's irrelevant. This here is your FB64 plot. So at a kind of a high level, this corner here is called the ridgeline point. Anything to the right of here, your compute bound on that architecture. Anything to the left, your memory bound on your architecture. All of this is covered in the paper. That's the last thing I'm going to say about it. This dot here means we're memory bandwidth bound. So based on the counting I just did, where we kind of did the math for a slightly different kernel, we did the math and we came out with a arithmetic intensity, this thing down here, of 0.32. And on here, it came out to roughly 0.32 if you squint your eyes and pretend you know how to read a log plot. So, OK, cool. It, it makes sense the way the code is written uh, that it's memory bandwidth bound. But does this make sense in terms of an algorithm? So let's, you know, again, you've, you've seen this little bit of content before. So we have this equation. We have a recursion relation that we build up everything from. Uh, so is this really a bandwidth bound operation? So in reality, uh, at the very start, we load, we load 16 bytes for A, 16 bytes for B, and then we're done. We're done loading things. We just compute, 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 compute. You know, we're doing order J cubed compute. So when you kind of uh, take this on naive face value, your arithmetic intensity can be arbitrarily large. And this is perfectly analogous to the case with matrix multiply. You know, it's n cubed compute, n squared uh, memory read write. So you take a ratio of those two, you know, computey things over memory IO things. It can be arbitrarily large. Same deal here. So in some regards, this should just be a compute bound kernel if we write, uh, write it correctly. Um, obviously, it's not this easy. There's no free lunch. You're generating a one by one, then two by two, then three by three, and so on up to nine by nine matrix. Uh, they just like don't kind of hang around there for free with quick access. Uh, they don't even necessarily fit in L1 because if they fit in L1, they would fit in L1, and we'd, we'd get the benefit of that. So now we can start asking questions like, can we refactor the algorithm to address this? So this is the part where I get really excited and start talking more quickly. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is this is very specific to SNAP. Your problem may be different. So, and this is where a lot of you are more of a mathematician than I am, more of a physicist than I am right now. So these are the types of things you bring to the problem. I can, like, I can be a code junkie with you, but you're the one who knows your equations. So you can just take what I gave you and run from there. But we can talk about it here. So remember I made that joke before that it kind of seemed like a little bit of BS, that there was only one equation and you need to use symmetry to compute the other things? That's because it was. It was complete garbage. It was a way to write the code. It was a correct way to write the code, you know, point one at the very start of my talk. Um, but it was leaving some details out. So this is the equation we've already seen. And this is... I want you know, column one, and I compute it from column one. There's a second equation um, where you want column one, you compute it from column zero. So that's how you can get like the very last element of the column. Uh, a fun backstory of this is uh, I was talking to Aiden Thompson about SNAP, and he suggested a three, four, 500 page tome on uh, quantum mechanics, uh, linear algebra identities. And he pointed me at the right page, and he said, have fun. And uh, jokes on him, I did. Uh, and I found this equation, um, which I say is a compliment to Aiden. He, uh, he believed in me, and, uh, and that's how you end up with faster code. I already talked about this. OK, so um, let's draw some pictures. So this is what we looked at before, you know, one by one, two by two, three by three, and so on. Equation one is an up arrow, just like before. And then equation two is an up and right arrow, uh, depending on how you, you can transpose it in your brain and get an up and left, whatever details. So the issue we ran into with our previous one is we were bandwidth bound. And that's because we're kind of running through our code. Things are spilling out L1 into L2 and global memory, which killed your performance. Things weren't hanging around for free. So now we're going to come up with a hybrid approach. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to explain what this you know, bend parameter is in a second. But we're going to do a, a graph traversal to get one part of the matrix. So we're going to use equation one, which is up arrows, to start, you know, get the first column or zero with column, depending on if you're in the mood for C, Fortran, or just like, you know, crayon counting. Um, compute the first column for U0, one half, and one. And then we bend and we construct our, yeah. We bend, use equation two to construct column one of this matrix and two of this matrix. And you can convince yourself that if you cover all of the, uh, the different bending points, you can cover all of the unique elements that you need. And then again, you can symmetrize to get everything else. Now, a really key uh, important part of this algorithm is unlike previously where you computed everything for the matrix and everything for the matrix and everything for the matrix, so things spill out a cache. You know, with this part of the algorithm, you're tracing one line at a time. So everything stays resident in L1 cache. Technically, the code manually manages it in, uh, in shared memory or scratch pad memory or whatever programming abstraction and hardware you're using. One really insane thing you may realize is there's a bunch of arrows hanging out on top of each other. Like, yeah, I'm doing redundant work, um, which is very scary on the CPU. GPU has so much compute. Oh my god, so much compute. And if we visualize that roof line plot back in our mind, you know, anywhere to the right of that ridge point, we're compute bound. So if you have some compute to spare, I have no idea where that train of thought was going. You can do redundant work on a GPU because it can do more flops per byte. End scene. All right, we're going to come back to planet Earth with that one. I got too excited. OK. All of this carries over exactly the same way when you're computing the derivative. So, you know, again, we've tortured ourselves with this product rule for equation one. Um, same picture. Um, you can take product rules yourself. You took kindergarten calculus, have fun, go wild. It, it looks like this, but, you know, it's letters are in different places and uh, yeah. So, but anyway, the same idea carries over. We just have to cache both of our, you know, our U matrices and the derivatives thereof in shared memory. And, you know, there's the same J-bend thing where you're building up as you go, bending at some point, and then to kind of compute everything, you cover all the different bend points and you get your matrices. Um, and then you can symmetrize. With this, we actually, you know, shared memory is a precious resource. The reason why this ends up working and is compute bound is because shared memory is so fast. So you don't have to, like, you're still accessing memory, but it's close by. Uh, to keep ourselves from blowing out that finite resource, though, we need to you know, cache things in shared memory. And we actually split this into three separate kernels for each derivative, which means we're doing a, a lot of recomputation. We're actually, we're recomputing this three times, and we have all this redundant work happening, but because GPUs are so compute heavy or happy, still faster. So I took a profile. Oh my God, perfs up. This seems a lot more reasonable. So we're limited by compute right now, which makes sense. We kind of, we went through our roof line argument. We convinced ourselves like, wow, this should be really compute bound. And we made it that way. An interesting thing is we're still flexing the memory subsystem. <clears throat> and that's because we're still reading things from shared memory uh, on NVIDIA GPUs since Volta. It's actually a unified L1 cache and uh, shared memory. So even though well, we, I'm talking about shared memory, that's why it's reading up as L1. Again, this is specific for this one. You're going to see maybe something different here that's scary in your code. Sit down with me. We'll talk about it. Um, I just said that. So everything kind of passes the laugh test, which is my favorite thing. Um, again, Insight gives us a roof line figure. We see here, you know, we're nice and compute bound. We're actually saturating like 50% of compute, which is cool. I was proud of that one. Um, a really important thing to note, again, is this figure that Insight gives you by default, uh, global or DRAM memory bandwidth, um, you could Harking back to the, my original thoughts, you could also draw a roof line for a unified cache bandwidth. And what you'd find 
based on this data, you'd still be solidly in a compute-bound regime based on how the code is implemented because compute is still more important than L1 cache. But it would be a, a very different picture. And I would have made that picture if I had time. But again, I finished this like three minutes before I gave the presentation. So this is it today. So this today is actually like, this is kind of a massive lie because a lot of other things got optimized. There was actually a bunch of kernel fusion. I fused these things. But you know, here's the new picture is, this compute UI is still there. Compute YI is still there. Uh, there was that really long kernel by our, by our measuring stick and like a smaller one that's been fused together into these fused and then fissioned into these three repetitions of the fused kernel, one for the X, Y, and Z derivative. Um, but the really cool thing and the only thing that matters, time to solution, uh, beforehand, those two kernels were 78 milliseconds. Now it's 14. So... Cool, man. Let's do more science. It's great. Um, OK, some last thoughts, and then you don't have to listen to me anymore. Um, profiler guided optimization or analysis-driven optimization is a systematic approach to identifying the performance limiters in your code, uh, also known as how to tell you what you should focus on as opposed to what's fun to focus on. You know, Again, resist shiny object syndrome. Make sure your code works first. If your code is wrong, it doesn't matter. I have written so much fast wrong code. It's crazy. <laughs> the way you implemented your code may not necessarily be ideal for your architecture or for the architecture you're on. So I did a lot of work talking about how I refactored one of the algorithms in SNAP for recursive polynomial calculation. I could get away with writing it that way because I knew I was on a GPU and I had a bunch of compute. On a CPU, I don't have that. Um, on a CPU and said the way it was originally written is actually really good because it's, uh, it's serially going through things. You're not dealing with multiple threads, all hitting cache at the same time. You actually do get good cache reuse with the way the CPU code was written. So this is also really an exercise in you know, understand your limiters and understand the architecture you're on because this exercise didn't help us on the CPU. You know, sit down with your algorithm and make sure it makes sense. This is kind of redundant of the previous point, everything I just said, so I'm not really going to say it again. But the, you know, the windowing of that in the context of my talk is we wrote down a bandwidth bound code and we had to figure out if that made sense. And on the GPU, it didn't. Uh, and again, last point, I just said a lot of words. I had code on the screen. I had command line commands. Oh my God, I hope, again, I hope none of you wrote it down. Look at the slides, come talk to me. I swear I try to be helpful. And that's it. Thanks. Thanks.